with us in our service here this morning. First day of hunting season. <laughs> Down a little bit, like 95%. No, I'm just kidding, of course. But it is good to have each one of you here with us here this morning. And it's wonderful to be going through the Bible here and finding out what the future uh, holds. Because not only is your future uh, told if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on that cross and paid for your sins, your future is a life with Jesus Christ in heaven for all eternity. But if for any reason you decide not to believe that, and you want to listen to religion, or you want to listen to men or preachers or so forth that don't believe that, then your future is also told. Depart from me, you're cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, I want to take just a second just go over this, because what we're going to speak on this morning is the judgment seat of Christ. And that is a judgment where every Christian is going to uh, appear. And that you and I, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, after the rapture, right after the rapture, in heaven, we stand before Jesus Christ to do one or two things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, that we're going to receive rewards according to the work that we've done and our faithfulness to the Lord. In verse 15, if any man's work shall suffer loss uh, of reward, then... He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. You're still saved. So it shows eternal security. So we're going through these passages here that speak about our judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. And it should be very, very interesting. But let me point out again, just as we go here. Here's the church age. We're at the point of the rapture. It could happen today. It's, uh, there's nothing in Bible prophecy to be fulfilled until the rapture comes. Everything is there. Uh, no, you're not in the last days. Men should be lovers of their own self, proud, boasters, and, uh, and so forth. Have a form of godliness, but no power thereof. The only power is in, in the gospel. Like Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power or the dynamite. It is the power. Only the gospel can take a person from hell to heaven, from earth to heaven. And that gospel, <laughs> very little of it anymore today. Because it's only the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that takes you to heaven. It's not walking in now. It's not going through all the rigmaroles that uh, religion has you to do and so forth. Teaching you that, well, you partake of the Lord's Supper, that helps a little bit. If you're baptized, that'll help you and so forth. All that's garbage. There's only one way to heaven. Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Didn't mention baptism. Didn't mention good works. Didn't mention all the religious paraphernalia that... Uh, Churches dream up, put in, sit there in the little councils and decree it and therefore put it into their doctrine and then you're supposed to follow that. But beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit after the traditions of men, the rudiments of the world and not after Christ, for Christ is the fullness of God, bodily Godhead. Okay, so we have the judgment seat of Christ. That's what we're going to study. During that time, right after this, then the next thing we're going into is the five nations that are going to be destroyed right after the rapture here. There's two things that take place. We find out a world council of men will get together, headed by what we know will be, after three and a half years, the Antichrist, and he'll make a covenant with Israel. But he breaks that covenant after three and a half years. But right in here, after he makes the covenant with Israel, here comes Russia. Here comes Libya. Here comes Persia. Well, as we know it as Iran, 1935, changed its name to Iran. Then we have Ethiopia. And then we have Germany. And those five allies are going to be with Russia. And they're going to invade Israel down here. And then God, and we get into that, it's going to be very interesting because they're all going to come on horses. And God is going to send a torrential rain that absolutely destroys them. And that's very interesting. In fact, when the Bible talks about there's only one, uh, I should say, there should be only part of them that are going to be destroyed here. The word is total annihilation in the Hebrew. And then he breaks the covenant with Israel, tries to kill everyone he can. And from the last three and a half years, you've got to take the mark of the beast or you're going to die. The Antichrist will run you down, he'll do anything to get a hold of you, and he'll kill you. But in this time here, there are two witnesses that God has that are going to stand up. There's 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of the nation of Israel, and they're going to be preaching the gospel here. 
Nothing can hurt them because they have the protection of God. Nothing can hurt them whatsoever. But then we come on down to the end of this, and there's a lot of things take place here that will pass you out some literature on and so forth like that. But now we're here. You see this judgment here, this chair here? That represents the judgment seat of Christ. That's where we're going to be at and what we're going to study here this morning. And then we find out that we have another judgment here. This judgment here is what is called the judgment of the nations. When Christ comes back from heaven to set the kingdom up here, he judges the nations. If you're saved, he'll say, come inherit the kingdom here for a thousand years. Come inherit the kingdom prepared for you from, uh, uh, from my God in heaven and so forth. Prepare the kingdom prepared for you. Inherit it. Then we have another judgment here, which is the judgment after the thousand year reign. Satan is chained here. He's chained in the bottomless pit. But after a thousand years, we find out that he's loosed. And he's going to get together of all the unbelievers during this thousand year reign because this thousand year reign begins with all Christians because those that are not saved are cast into the uh, uh, lake of fire, you see. That's the judgment. Then we start with all Christians, but they're going to have children. They're all going to be in human bodies. And they're going to end the millennium here. They're going to have children. And after a thousand years, there's going to be the number of people that do not trust Christ, even though he is here in person. David is sitting upon the throne over there, judging the nation of Israel. You have the, the ones, the Israelites there, judging. You're going to be part of this. You're going to make sure that there's peace. Now, they're going to be unbelievers, but they can't do anything. I mean, as far as outright, there'll be no rapes. There'll be no nothing. In fact, this thousand years will be like it was before the flood. Just the same. Animal kingdom will be the same. There will be mo no more eating of the meat or anything else like that. It will be a perfect peace. The animals won't be eating one another. Foxes won't be eating squirrels and everything else. Or bears won't be attacking uh, uh, that. Wolves won't be eating antelope and elk and so forth like that. It's going to be a perfect peace here. Talked about in the Book of Romans. So it's going to be very interesting. But then we have what is called here. This is the great white throne judgment. And this is for all of the lost that are found at the end here. So, when that takes place, they are judged according to, they're, in, uh, uh, they're judged here and then thrown into hell. But those in torment, all of the lost, are still there. They're brought up here and they're judged according to the degrees of punishment in the lake of fire. And you'll find that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14 where death and Hades, this is Hades, torment is had the Greek Hades, are brought up, and they are cast into the lake of fire, and that is the second death. Very interesting. Now, if you've got your uh, little sheet there to follow along, you can add to it anything that you wish to do that, we go through, but let's go in our Bibles over here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 9 and 10, all right? <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Corinthians here in chapter 5, in verse 9 and 10. And we find out over here, it says, Therefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. In verse 9. And then, in verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now a very interesting word here is accepted. Accepted here is a Greek word, you aristos, and the E-U is well in the Greek, and the aristos is meaning pleasing, therefore well-pleasing, because what is said is, and you'll find that the false teachers will take any piece of scripture or anything there without the context. They'll just pull it out and not read the context or anything else, and here's what they say. They say, wherefore, we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. So, we labor and God's going to judge if we do enough of it, then maybe God will accept us and take us to heaven. And that's what they do, what they use. But, we find out here, the word accepted, the translation of that in the Greek should be, into the English, that we labor so we'll be well-pleasing to the Lord. It has nothing to do with salvation because this is written to Christians. 
They're already Christians. They don't lose their salvation. They're not laboring to go to heaven because they were saved by grace through faith, not of themselves. It was a gift to God, not of works, least any man should boast. Now, it also, it sort of instills a mental peace here of knowing that you are serving the Lord and you're doing with your uh, gifts and your talents and so forth that you're giving them when possible to do to the Lord. You're using your life for the Lord. You know, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is only our reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that uh, good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How many times have you had something from the world try to keep you from serving the Lord? It's all over. It's for every Christian. I remember when we were down in uh, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, we had a Lutheran call, and uh, he was from the Ministerial Association. And he says, uh, well, uh, Pastor Gount, uh, you've just arrived, and we want to welcome you and invite you to the Ministerial Association. And uh, he said, we meet on, I said, well, I don't need to go any further, because I'm not one bit interested. Why would you want me? I said, I'm just going to be honest with you, you're sending people to hell because you're telling them water baptism takes them to heaven, and I'm telling you, sir, you are a liar, and I don't want anything to do with you. Now you say, well, that's harsh. No, that's not harsh. That's not harsh at all. What's harsh about it? Do I want it? Doesn't it say, come out from among you, be ye separate, saith the Lord? Why play around these little handsy-pansy little games here and want to be just liked and so forth? You are, and I didn't tell him this, I told uh, you what I said to him, and that ended the conversation right there. But the point is this. Why do I want to play handsy pansies and just be liked in the community here with Satan's ministers? All false teaching comes from Satan. And their ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness in order to suck you in and send you to hell by their philosophy to get your money to pay for their retirement. That's what all these churches do. Your Methodist church does it. All of your Lutheran churches do it. Because if you're a member of that church, or the Catholic church, you've got to send money to the organization, folks. I don't know. How would you like to send money to the Catholic church after you listen to the radio broadcast this morning with all those hundreds and millions and billions and billions and billions of dollars in 10 cities was over $500 million, or maybe billions, I forget which now, they paid out to these pedophiles. 48.5% are homos, 55% in the convents now preparing to become priests, 55% of them are homos. How would you like to send your money there? But you've got to send, each organization has to send in their money to the hierarchies. Who do you think pays for the president there? Who do you think pays for the secretary? Who do you pay, think pays for all this literature they send out that you've got to preach of what they tell you to preach? This comes from the organization. I thank God I don't belong to one. Why? We don't belong to one. The first thing when we came to Walnut Grove, if you didn't know this, I think every missionary within a thousand miles of here contacted me. Well could, well, could you help support us over in Italy? Could you help support us over in Afghanistan or, or any foreign country, Japan, we're a missionary? I said, I'll tell you what, I finally figured out how to do this and be nice. We have so many that contact us, I'm just going to put you in the files under one and what line you're in. Right now you're 150th. <laughs> and I said, right now we're a missionary, so we can't support anybody. We, we, we can't. I'm working a full-time job trying to get a church and everything else and so forth. And the biggest mistake that churches make is, and this is, you want to send money all over the country and starve the preacher to death. you got to be kidding. If you want a church, you got, you got to support to where the preacher can study. If he can't study, you're going to get 1% milk. I don't know if you like that chalk-tasting bunch of junk, but I don't. I like... I'm even down to 2%, and I don't really like that. I like the 3% because I like the embodiment of milk. So I know I'm there. In fact, I don't drink McDonald's anymore because it's 1%. 
Now, I like the orange juice. I just transferred orange juice, you know. That's, that's just my personal <laughs> thing. But we got hit with everything. I had a five, I finally threw them all away. But we had a whole thing that the first thing you're starting a church will support us, support us. First of all, support the church you're starting, amen? That's what you got to do. You can't support and send your money all over the country to every one of these. And we had one from a man that we ordained here. And he called me. And uh, well, now, this is one church, and all uh, the whole conversation was we're doing this now. I've decided to uh, start a church. Well, I told him before he ever left. Quit running psychology classes and start a church. Teach the Bible. People love to tie the preacher up in counseling services. And oh, you feel so important. They've come to me for counseling. 90% of them wouldn't do what you tell them. I'll never forget a man that came to our church. He was from Revere to the home. He said, uh, Pastor, can I see you after church? He sure can. He said, I wonder if you could come about three times a week and, and uh, come out. He said, uh, I've got to have some counseling. I said, what's the problem? I lost my drinking. He said, I've lost my home. I've lost my children and uh, my wife and uh, divorced. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I can't do that, but I'll, I'll be glad to give you counseling right now. Quit drinking. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. You want me to come out there and babysit and change your diaper for you? No, I'm not going to do that. No, that's not what it's for. You know, all of this counseling and that, but, oh, you feel so good. I'm taking my time. I'm helping people. Baloney, teach you. If you're called to be a preacher, study and teach the people the Bible. Amen? I don't see anything wrong with that. That's what we're called to do. So, anyway, that's the last I've ever heard of this one, and uh, so forth, and everything I suggested to him about preaching the Bible. Oh, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, and I'm doing that. I said, yeah, well, if you're doing that, why are you starting it now? You should have been, if you're doing it before, you wouldn't have to start it, amen? So, anyway, we didn't end on a, the most pleasant thing, and I haven't heard from him since. Well, too bad, too bad. Uh, that's not mine. Preachers are called to preach the Bible, teach the Bible, study the Bible, and spend time with their congregation. You are first before any outsider gets any money about anything or waste my time about anything. You are first, and if I have time for them, fine. If I don't, then they'll get somebody else. That's the preacher's job. In other words, it comes down to this. Get your priorities right, amen? Absolutely. I think people need to hear that, and they need to know that, you know. You haven't got time to run all over the place and all of this and that and listen to everybody's gripes and complaints and heartaches and everything else. Now, back to the judgment seat of Christ. Lord. We took a little trip around first, second, and third. We're back at home plate and ready to go. Okay, here we go. He says here, uh, Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I'm meek and lowly and hard. You'll find rest unto your souls. When you put the Lord first, you have a rest and a peace that God wants you to have. And you don't have a guilty conscience because when you're putting the Lord first, you're wiping the guilty conscience out because you know you're doing what the Lord wants you to do. It's very simple. It's sad when you got to live and you know, I'm not putting the Lord first. That, that you got a guilty conscience. You're not going to tell anybody. You're going to smile all the time and all this and that, but you got a guilty conscience. And uh, I know what it's like. I did that for a year. You know, a few times since, but I mean full time for a year, you know. And uh, I think when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll get to that, that when we find out that we're going to give an account of ourselves there, which means it's not going to just be passing out rewards. The word in the Greek, give an account of ourselves, literally means that we're going to have a communication back and forth with the Lord. And I imagine when it comes to the sins of commission and the sins of omission, I think when it hits the sins of omission, the Lord's going to say, all right, I'll say a few things to him. And he'll hand me a list of about a thousand things that has every excuse I've ever used why I couldn't do something for him. And he said, uh, what this produces is no rewards. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that great? I'm, and I'm, I'm going to have a list. I hope it's not that many, but and I'm not really happy about that. I'd like to get rewarded for what I do, but when it comes to facing reality and honesty within myself, uh, 
I'm not so sure I like that word accepted in the Greek. We'll get to it here because I'd always heard the judgment seat of Christ is a rewarding stand. It's the Bema seat. It's the rewarding stand. You're not going to be embarrassed over the things that you let the Lord down and didn't do and didn't serve Him until we looked up the word accepted here or the word there. And uh, I'm going to find out that uh, I'm going to uh, have to give an account or the word account, I should say. But anyway, let's go on down. Here we go. Satan's crowd, as we said here, sometimes we use verse 9 saying that you must have good works by laboring for the Lord to inherit eternal life. This is easily refuted by the fact that judgment place takes place after the rapture and it takes place in heaven. Therefore, the we must all includes the spiritual and the carnal, whether it be good or bad. In other words, how could the bad be in heaven if it takes good works to get there, as these false teachers proclaim? You see. Now, let's go on, okay? <clears throat> We're on the next page, page two here. <clears throat> Christ encountered the same Pharisees as the Christians face today, and here's Christ's review of these heretics. In Luke 18, 9, and he, that's Christ, spake this parable unto certain Pharisees which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. These are your work salvation people. You know, they want to get you to have good works just like they do, trust in themselves. And then in Luke 16, 15, And he, Christ, said unto them as Pharisees, You are they which justify yourselves. And before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God, in Luke 16, 15. So Christ rebuked them. You know what? You face the same Pharisees today. Well, if you don't have good works, and so forth. I was up at the filling station this morning. It wasn't open there. I think uh, uh, up there they forgot to set the clock back or something, but... It wasn't, it wasn't open. Uh, said it opens at 8, but when we set our clock back, it was 7, right? I was there at 7, but they still wouldn't open. And I met a guy in the boar booms, just had their mother that died here, and there's boar booms all over uh, here. But I got talking to him and so forth, and he was, he was a talker. I had to raise my hand three times before I get a chance to say anything. And, uh, but anyway, they were in the car there, and they were on their way back to Wisconsin. They hadn't seen some of the rallies for something like 35, 40 years. And I said, well, one glorious thing was that when we have Jesus Christ and we're trusting him to pay for our sins instead of ourselves, we'll see our relatives again. And I hope you'll see your mother again. And he began to tell me all the wonderful things and how well his mother was like for the next 10 minutes. And, oh, wonderful lady, she did good things. She made 100 quilts in her lifetime. And uh, just going through all this kind of thing. But knowing the Boar Booms are all Catholics. I know that. Because we had one of the relatives that came to our church and wanted to see me after church and said, you're the reason my dad won't trust Christ as his Savior. He listens to you on the radio and you've got him so mad. And we don't like your approach. And I said to him, I said, uh, now I'm just going to take a guess. You have to tell me how old are you? Well, they were in their mid-30s and so forth. And I said, evidently, your approach don't work either. He'd have been saved too, wouldn't it? So why are you criticizing me when your approach hadn't worked? You know, well, they didn't like that too well. I've never heard from them since. They live out west somewhere. <coughs> it's amazing how somebody always wants to blame somebody, you know. All right, well, let's go on down here, if you will, okay? Now we come on down, and let's go here. At the judgment seat, every knee shall bow, every one. And that means that every Christian is going to be there, whether you want to or not. You don't have a choice. You're going to be there. And this is a judgment, and it's going to be an honest judgment. So we come here, and let's go here to Romans chapter 14, verse 10 to 12. Why doest thou judge thy brother, or why doest thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, every Christian. It is as written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall, shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now, the word all in verse 10, no Christian can escape the judgment as it includes the faithful and the unfaithful. Therefore, as they have lived their lives after they were saved. Now, the reason that we emphasize this, that we shall instead of should, and both of those are the same Greek word, shall and good. 
or shall and should. But it's only determined by the context of both the same Greek word. Here it would be improbable to translate this as should because it would be left up to your free will whether you're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ or not. Well, we should be. So you have a choice. No, the translators translated it properly as shall because there's no if, ands, or buts. It's a positive. You will be there. That's the reason it's translated shall here. And when we get over to another verse, it's going to be translated as should because concerning that on confessing Christ is up to your free will. God does not take away your free will and make you a robot that you testify to everyone that you meet. He will not impede. He wants you to love him and to serve him because he first loved you. Period. And he'll never take away that free will. Now, another thing we come on down. Every Christian is going to be there looking to see. I've heard, and I've heard this by some, I was taught this in Bible college, and I've heard it from preachers, that at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, it's only for the passing out of rewards. That, uh, that was good news, because there are some things, I think when the Lord does, I hope he takes me in a closet somewhere where you can't hear everything. You know, I'm not going to be interested in yours with a uh, loss of rewards. I sure don't want you to listen to mine. Amen? And uh, that's why we don't get into that much in church. You know, maybe the thing here. But uh, to make a long story short, anyway, we're all going to be there. Now, look at the word account. Very interesting word here. It is the Greek logos for a word. Isn't that something? Give an account, you'd never think it was. Because we think of Logos being the Word, in the beginning was the Word in John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, all things were made by Him, was not anything made that wasn't made by Him. And then verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, literally means tabernacle, among us, the Word. But that's when it's referring to a person, but isolated person, Therefore, when it's also used, it has another meaning to it. Also, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. The word account is the Greek logos. Its meaning is a word or saying. Now, this comes from your, uh, I should say, your dictionary of Greek words, by Vine's dictionary of Greek words. And it means an account which one gives by word of mouth. It also... It also means, denotes the expression of thought, not the mere name of an object. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Greek Words. So, when we give an account, it appears from the meaning of the word account that there will be an exchange of words between our Savior and His children at the judgment for rewards or loss of rewards. It's wonderful to be rewarded for our faithfulness and dedicated service to Him. On the other hand, here comes the other hand. On the other hand, it could be embarrassing should one be addressed about their sins of omission. Well, why didn't I do the things that I had the opportunity to do for the Lord? And again, the Lord may respond by just handing me a record of the hundreds of excuses I've given him, which were of no value except loss of rewards. Be a little embarrassing. I just hope you don't name all of them. All right, <laughs> you better pray for that. I, maybe you won't, I don't know. Then there are the sins of commission. And that is those things that I did that I knew were wrong. You ever do something you really knew was wrong? Whether it be lose your temper or one thing or another. Have you ever, if you can't think of anything, just ask your wife. <laughs> and if she can't think of anything, just ask your husband. Yeah, I, I think he can come up with something or she can come up with something. We all have. All have done this since the commission. Those things that I did that I knew were wrong, all of us will be guilty sometime, and some Christians guilty many times. I wouldn't be surprised if the Lord didn't remind us of James 2.17. If a man knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is said. Boy, that's a tough one to get around, you know? If you know to do good and you just don't do it, to him it is sin. Let me ask you something. Did we uh, bring any, how many forgot about bringing something to the Cub Scouts for the 
For, <laughs> I know. <laughs> what do you have next Sunday? Shows the boxes are downstairs. So uh, don't feel bad. I almost did too. So, uh, but uh, I shouldn't have thrown that in. But I'm just joking anyway. Because that can that that can happen, you know. <clears throat> now, our Savior, who is the Master Teacher, also used the Greek word logos for our English word account. And the reason I put that in because it brings out a doctrinal statement concerning the Trinity. And I want to use that. Uh, you'll find out here. If we go to, and uh, he also used it here uh, in Luke chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. And give an account. He, Christ, said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. He called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear uh, this of you? Give an account. That's the Greek logos. Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Okay, so it's used as far as a communication between one and one. You're going to have to give an account for that. Now, the Greek word also is also translated as an object, that being the divine God and the divine Son, Jesus Christ, in John 1.1. 1, 1. Now notice this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was the Word, Greek Logos, the Word, Greek Logos, was with God, and the word Greek logos was God. Same word is translated, uh, appears as given account, but it's used in a different sense. And the reason we put this in is just to go to show you it's good to look up these words once in a while because they can be the same Greek word but have a different application according to the context of it. And it's good to look that up. Now, we come down here, John 1, 14, the Word became flesh, and so forth like that. Now, another thing we find out, the title is also used in, I should say, 1 John chapter 1, here in verse 7, documenting the Trinity. And I wanted to bring this out here because the Trinity is attacked so many times. And since we're on logos here, we could do that. Notice here, if you will, the Word was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. This title is also used in 1 John 5, in verse 7, documenting the Trinity. Very seldom brought out. Because you're always asked, well, explain the Trinity. How can God be the Father? How can He be the Son? And how can He be the Holy Spirit? Can you explain it? Well, if you can, let me know. I have no idea how you can explain something because it transgresses the human mind. Can you explain how God put the sun up there 93 million miles away so that it doesn't, uh, why isn't it 193 million miles away and we'd all freeze up? Why isn't it 15 million miles away and we'd burn up? Can you explain that? God says when he talked to Job in uh, there, uh, 38 chapter, he said, Gird up your loins like a man and, then, and uh, explain to me, where was you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where was you at? Why do they stay there? Why is the earth tilted 23 and a half degrees? Why isn't it 29 or 30 degrees? Why is it just perfect? Why is everything just held together? Why doesn't it just fly away? All the astronauts that ever went up and uh, went out there to Mars and so forth, they ever find any guide wires to the earth here? Why, why, why is it just here, and what, what makes it just rotate perfectly all the time there, and so forth? Why does it just turn? Why does it just turn? Well, explain the Trinity to me then. I'm sure if you can explain how God created all this universe and everything like that, that you can surely explain. And explain to me about your human body. Why are your ears on the way the earth is upside down every time it rained? You know what? You drown. Or your nose. Why is your nose the way it is here down with the openings turning down? If it was up, you'd have to cover up every time you went out in the rain or snow or anything else there. You'd, I'll tell you what, you'd be coughing up and, and throwing up. You'd have so much fluid down there and so forth. Unbelievable. And I don't care what you eat. Whether you're a vegetarian, whether you eat meat, whether you eat fish, I don't care what you eat. All those 233 joints you got in your body get oil. Isn't that amazing? How did that happen? How does God know what to take of the food that you eat 
and get rid of what he should get rid of and keep what he should keep and then put it into the bloodstream and it goes around and, and it furnishes every part of the body. Tell me how that works, will you? Can you tell me? No. But you want to know how the Trinity works, how God is the Father, how God is the Son, how God is the Holy Spirit? Well, when you figure it out, let me know. But I'll tell you this, it's true. Because if God wasn't the Son, the Son couldn't pay for our sins because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, the Son has to be God in human flesh, of which He is. And if you go back to John chapter 1, and I'd like for you to see this. Let's go back to John chapter 1 in verse 1 again, okay? And look, John chapter 1 in verse 1, I just want to show you this. This is sort of interesting here. John chapter 1 verse 1, because they're all involved. I think we got this coming up. I want to put this here. John chapter 1 in verse 1, if you'll notice this, logo. In the beginning was the Word, that's logos. And the Word, logos, was God. So the Word was God. And the Word, here we go, was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It wasn't God. And we're going to find out the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us in verse 14. So the Word is Jesus Christ, and yet the Word is God. So it has to be one and the same. You see, it has to be one and the same. Because the Word is used for both of them. And it was. Okay. Now let's go on down. I want to look at something else. We find out also here, as we go on down here, in 1 John 5, 7, we find out it is, in fact, I'm hitting myself a little bit. Let's go over here to 1 John. Go back here to 1 John here, chapter 5, all right? 1 John here, chapter 5. Clear to the end of your Bible here, poor Jude. 1 John here, chapter 5, okay? 1 John, chapter 5. Here, okay, okay. Okay, notice in verse 7, it says here, There are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They are one in the same. Of course, if you have an NIV, they'll corrupt your mind by saying they're just in agreement, is what they say. And then they'll go and put a little footnote down here, which you have no idea what it's talking about. But the late manuscripts from the Vulgate says one. Well, do you know anything about the Vulgate? Do you know what the late manuscripts are? You have absolutely no idea. And they won the case here. They're just in agreement, but they're not the same. And then you'd have to go look up the Vulgate and figure that out. And, and uh, by the manuscripts from the Vulgate, when it comes down to this, they threw you all off of the track. When the majority text of over 95% of all of the manuscripts, of the 5,300 Greek manuscripts or more, 54, all of those 95% have the word one. They are the same. But your NIV will throw you off saying they just agree. You see. And then they put a little fine line down here. Well, the Vulgate says, and the late manuscripts, the Vulgate says that they were one. What? You talk about satanic, trying to confuse people and so forth like that. We're only bringing these things out just to go show you some things that you're not going to get from other places. You're not going to get it. But these things are good to know, you say. Okay, now let's go on here. Then we come here and we find out that a complementary verse of the Old Testament, 1 John, 1 John, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's the one we use on Jewish people all the time because they don't believe the Trinity. And yet the first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God is the Trinity because it is El is God, the I am is the plural in the Hebrew, and the Hebrew word is Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. E-L is God, the I am is the more. So, those in Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, this Hebrew, Elohim, three, created, this is the Trinity. Now, if God would have used Jehovah, which would be all capital letters, how many of you have a King James Bible? There, you have a King James Bible? You have it? Okay. 
The King James translators made this distinction. Wherever you see a capital E and then Elohim, or I should say this, a capital G for God, and a small O-D, that is always the Hebrew word Elohim. When you see all capital letters, like God is all capital, and so forth, Lord is all capital, that is always Jehovah. That's always Jehovah. That's singular. Now, if God would have used Jehovah, in the beginning Jehovah created the heavens and the earth, you'd have a contradiction in the Bible. Because that's singular. Then there'd be no place, if it said another place that Jesus Christ created all things, you'd have a contradiction. So God used exactly the right Hebrew, and if it said another place that the Spirit of God brooded over the earth and was part of the creation, they couldn't be part of the creation or you have a contradiction because Jehovah is singular. So he had to use the word for God, which uh, means to put her forth the power. He had to use Elohim, God, which means three or more, to include God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we'll just show that to you here. Okay? That's a... God the Father created, okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? So we got the first person of the Trinity. Christ the Son created. Notice in John 1, 2, and 3. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we have to have three or more, so that's the second person of the Trinity. And then, if you'll look here, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Holy Spirit created. Because, and the earth was without form and void, darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So we have the Holy Spirit creating and getting it ready for human consumption, okay? So we just wanted to put that in there to show you a little bit about how precise the Word of God is and the Holy Spirit because all scriptures are given by the inspiration of God. Profitable for doctrine, reproof, and instruction into righteousness and, and so forth. So, but in order, every word had to be perfect because if God would have used singular and you would have seen all capital letters, that would have meant Jehovah. Jehovah. And that would have been, in the original, it was J-H-V-H, the vowels are supplied. Tetragrammaton is what it's called there. And we find out he had to use Elohim to include God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense to you at all? Not quite, but you're thinking about it, huh? Okay. Well, you got it written down so you can take it home and study it, you see. So, okay, well, let's go here and then uh, we'll close here this morning, okay. See what our time is here. We got coming down here to the end here. What's God's will for his children then? We find out here, if we go here, to Philippians chapter 2 and verses 9 to 11. And we have it on here. This talks about also what we should do. This is the same word as shall. We shall all stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We shall. He didn't say should because you don't have a choice. But now in these scriptures, you have a choice. God doesn't take away your free will. So we come here and let's begin to read here. And wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, in verse 9, and uh, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should, this is the same Greek word as shall that we have over there in 2 Corinthians and so forth, 5.10. We should bow the things in heaven, the things in the earth, the things under the earth, in verse 10, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, we come here, the word should, which is from the Greek Melo, it is the same Greek word that is translated shall three times in Romans chapter 14, verse 11 and 12. The Greek word melo is used in various ways depending upon the context. It may be used to show free will. It may be used to show purpose, certainty, compulsion, or necessity as the context, or context, I'm sorry, requires, okay? So, since Romans 14, 11 and 12 is speaking of the judgment seat of Christ where every Christian will be present, 
Therefore, the word shall is used, showing the absolute certainty that all Christians will be present according to the context, whether they want to or not. In other words, you would not translate this Greek word mellow as should, as this would leave it up to the free will of the Christian whether they would be there or not, and this would contradict the context of the scripture. Does that make sense to you? Does that follow? Well, it, uh, it might if you study it a little more. Okay, here we go. Now, we come to Philippians down here, 2.10, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Bow is the Greek, kapto, and it literally means to bend. In the spiritual sense, you're bending your knee and bowing in adoration and exaltation to your Savior, the Lord Jesus. Now, if you notice also <clears throat> in Philippians 2.10, of things in heaven, well, what are the things in heaven that are going to bow? Well, Let's see what it says. There are many things. We just listed a couple just to go to show you that these are fulfilled, okay? Of things in heaven, the seraphims, the four beasts, had each of them six wings about them. They were full of eyes within, and they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat upon the throne, who liveth and abideth forever, these are the ones in heaven here. These are the angelic hosts. These are the same seraphims of Isaiah chapter 6 in verse 2 and 6, some of God's heavenly angelic creatures. Now, also we find out of these things in heaven that are going to bow are the four and twenty elders. And the four and twenty elders fell down before him, sat on the throne, worshipped him, and liveth forever and ever, cast their crowns before the throne, saying, in verse 10, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure. Uh, they are and were created. So, we find out that things are going to bow and give credit to the Lord here of things in heaven. Now, let's come to here of the things in earth. Well, that's very simple. We should of things in heaven, yeah. And things in earth be wonderful if every Christian had the same attitude as the Apostle Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. We should, but we don't have to. It's your choice. What's important in your life? And then the third thing it says, then, that's going to bow, of things under the earth. And you wonder, what in the world is that? What under the earth? What's under the earth? All right, look up here just a second. I'll show you what's under the earth. Torment. You still have all the lost in torment. They're still there. Torment and paradise separated by a big gulf here. <clears throat> but when Christ ascended back into heaven, what is it that he first descended into the lower parts and then ascended up on high? And what he did, he led captivity captive. Those that were captive in paradise in the center of the earth where Christ went no longer is there. Paradise now is up in the third heaven up here. And this is the cloud of saints that went up there when Christ ascended back after the resurrection. So the only thing left in the center of the earth are the lost. That's the only ones left, okay? Let's notice here. They're in torment, that's Hades, in the center of the earth. They're going to remain there. And These that are lost at the tribulation here, they take the mark of the beast, you see. Now, we come here and we find out, what about all the lost here during this time here? What about all these lost here? Well, these are going to be brought up with these. And they're going to stand at the great white throne judgment. We don't have that up there, but that's the great white throne, or here it is, the great white throne judgment. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Now, a very interesting thing, if you ever thought about this, what about those that are in Hades today? Okay. They're in Hades today, when God judges the nations there, and I, I mis said that, when I said they go into torment, at the end of the tribulation period, when he judges the nations there, and there for the kingdom here, they go into the lake of fire. Now, we come down here, and do you ever wonder about this? We come over here to Revelation in chapter 20 and verse 14. Those in torment are there, we're going to remain there, and joined by the lost of the tribulation unsaved during the millennium, at the great white throne judgment, at the end of the millennium, all the lost will be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. This is the second death. 
So when you go in your Bible there to Revelation and the final judgment, it actually begins at the great white throne judgment in verse 11 on. You come to verse 14, which is a finalization of it, and it says, then those that death and hell, that's Hades, that's what is in the center of the earth, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. Now, interesting enough, and then we'll close, we're right down the end. Those in hell should bow in acknowledgement that they put themselves there, not God. Now, when it uses that in Philippians there, when it says they should, they don't have to. They're in hell for all time and eternity. But truthfully, they should bow. Why would they bow? Well, we put in here just something to think about. In hell... They're now living in the torments of hell. How could they not remember the many times they've been witness to? Because they're going to be reminded of that at the Great White Throne Judgment. There will be some that will curse God for all eternity and torment. There will be others that will remember that God loved them and gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to pay for their sins. They'll be honest enough not to blame God for their demise. Some will acknowledge that they are there of their own free will by their own free will of choice to believe or not believe, they made the wrong choice. And no doubt, they'll be reminded of all of those who have witnessed to them, but they refused to listen and took the word of men over the word of God, and they'll be in hell for all eternity. But they'll have the mental knowledge of knowing why they're there, just like the man in Luke 16. He had the mental knowledge, uh, mental knowledge of knowing that I've got five brethren. Will you please go back and tell them not to come to this place of torment? So they have a lot of things to remember. They remember the five brethren back there. So did the saints in Revelation chapter 6. I saw the saints in them that were slain for the word of God. That's during the last half of the tribulation. And they cried out with a loud voice, How long will it be, O Lord, before you avenge our blood on them that killed us on the earth? It's in verse 8 and 9. And uh, so they had quite a memory. So will these that's going to be in hell. I'm sure it will prick their minds. I should have listened to that Christian that tried to tell me that Jesus Christ was the only way to heaven. But I wouldn't listen. Let's just bow in a word of prayer and we'll close, okay? With every head bowed and every eye closed, you never trust the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope that you do it this morning. All you have to do is realize that, you know what? We've all sinned. I'm, I'm part of the whole world. And I don't want to pay for my sin in hell. And I believe, dear Lord, that you love the world. And if you paid for my sin, you love me and you sent Christ. And he came from heaven to earth. Pay for my sin so I could leave earth and live with him for all time and eternity in heaven. I believe you did that for me, and I am so thankful that you love me because I've done a lot, a lot of things wrong. But so is everybody else because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Thank you that I'll never praise but have eternal life, and I am so relieved to know that. I thank you so much for loving me because while I was a sinner, Christ died for me, you see. If you never trust him, I hope you'll do it now. We thank you for all you do, dear Lord. Give us a good day today. Bless each one here in Jesus' precious name. Amen.